Let me start by saying assalamu alaikum, you are in Abu Dhabi. And it is good evening. Now I think it is evening, it's no longer afternoon. Speakers, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to discuss a very important topic on the economic and social issues of our region. Let me start by thanking the organizers for the invitation and welcoming all of you to this workshop. Um, as I'm a person who is in economics and finance and not in politics, so I'll be mainly speaking about those issues. There are more qualified speakers to speak about the social issues and political issues. But for our region, it's anticipated that economic growth in Arab countries of course, like the rest of the world, will be affected by several factors during this year and next year, including slower global growth, tight global and regional financial conditions, volatility in commodity prices, and country-specific factors. All those factors are, alike, are likely to expose vulnerabilities arising from very high public debt to certain countries and weak external conditions, and here I mean balance of payments in terms of economic issues. The growth this year by the uh, forecast of the Arab Monetary Fund is expected to be around 2.2% for Arab countries, and next year to uh, increase to 3.3%. Uh, for the inflation, and if we exclude three or four countries in our region, it's expected to moderate to stabilize at 3.6% next year. Um, on the country's level, some countries in the region are experiencing several economic and financial challenges, crises, whatever would um, uh, describe the situation leading to increasing the already high unemployment and poverty. Um, some countries in the region um, also have issues of, you know, uh, uh, refugees and humanitarian crisis. So those tensions will, of course, increase risk premium, making borrowing even much harder. We at the Arab uh, Monetary Fund are, from our part, doing all what we can do in a sense of design and manage the reform, the economic reform programs in several countries. So, so far on this year, we have, uh, uh, we have um, provided financial assistance exceeding one billion US dollars since the beginning of this year. We also provide technical assistance and capacity building and uh, provide also a um, uh, uh, place for policy dialogue between our member countries. Today, we are very fortunate to have very well-known speakers. I will have no uh, difficulties introducing each one of them, as probably most of you or all of you, you know, those speakers. Uh, they have different backgrounds and they have rich experience to talk about economic and social issues in our region. We will discuss regional economic landscape, explore growth, development issues, diversification strategies, sustainability, and demographic trends, education, food security, water, social issues, and developments. Let me start by the only female on our panel, uh, Dr. Mona Makramovic. She, deals, she doesn't need an introduction. She is Egyptian senator, advisor to the UN High Representative for the Alliance of Civilizations, former member of the parliament. She will be um, giving us an overview of the main political, economical, social changes in the region, um, uh, facing the region at large, and probably she might focus on Egypt. And what would be the opportunities? Whenever there are challenges, there are opportunities too. And Dr. Mona, you have 15 minutes to have the, your introductory remarks, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I feel very honored to have to be next to you now. And unfortunately, I'm not an economist. I am a political scientist, 
And so I will approach more my subject in a political sense with social transformation uh, happening in Egypt. So let me first start by Egypt and how much this uh, crisis, this Gaza crisis, this Palestine crisis has affected Egypt, has affected the whole Arab world, but, and the whole world, in fact, from watching the horrific, uh, the horrific images that we see on television. But what I can say also is that the turmoil in Gaza is not entirely a bad thing for the regime of President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. In many respects, his government has, would be happy to see Israel eliminate Hamas, an organization that grew out of the Muslim Brotherhood, hated by President Sisi, hated by the Arab, the Egyptian public opinion. The Egyptian public opinion, the Egyptians in general, have seen what it is to have a, an Islamist regime trying to change the identity of the country, trying to make it uh, an Islamist racist country and so on, forgetting what the Egypt really stands for, which is a secular, modern, democratic country. Now, on the other hand, the Egyptian public today is outraged by the ongoing Israeli bombardment of Gaza. And like most of its counterparts across the region, it prizes stability over domestic accountability. Now, in Egypt, the post-presidential elections, as I was just said, in 2013, boiled down to a context between the military and the brotherhood, and in which uh, a victory, which squeezed out a victory, but they proved the Muslim brotherhood meaning, they proved to be incompetent and mostly mediocre, and easily undermined by opponents, both at home and abroad, particularly in the Gulf region, where, uh, who feared uh, Islamist political movements. Now, the removal of, he was called Morsi, the president at the time, his removal of office marked the end of Muslim Brotherhood rule. But for the moment, Egypt's refusal to admit Palestinian refugees, which is a big question, is a matter of principle that many people don't understand. They think that Egypt is refusing humanitarian help. No. In so far, there is any residual commitment in the Arab world to a solution uh, of, the, of the Israeli, of the Israeli uh, conflict, there will never be anyone accepting to displace the uh, Palestinian uh, or Gazan, uh, or Gazan uh, community into Sinai. So economically, Egypt's long-standing dependence on full and food imports has bloated its foreign debt. I'm talking now economically. Uh, has bloated its foreign debts thanks in part to the war in Ukraine, the COVID-19, and securing international financing has grown more costly and more domestic subsidies continue to drain government resources. The resulting economic crisis has led to several rounds of currency devaluation mandated by the International Monetary Fund and skyrocketing inflation, which is hurting not only the poor, but also the middle class, which is the main support of President Sisi. As you know, Egypt is going through presidential elections this month. So Egyptians is more than any Egyptian government. Uh, um, Egyptians, now that they put pressure on Egyptians to accept the Palestinian community into Sinai, the president has refused adamantly because it means the end of the Palestinian question if uh, these people are displaced once more. So Egyptians, more than any Egyptian government, 
could not tolerate such a thing. Moreover, many Hamas militants would likely escape into Egypt, creating yet another headache for the authorities. That is why one of the other reasons that Egypt is refusing. For the moment, we are insisting that he, uh, President Sisi is in his insisting that the United Nations, the European Union, and others should help provide humanitarian assistance for the people in Gaza. I want to underline, do not underestimate General, Sisi, uh, General Sisi's role, because Egypt has maintained very good relations with Israel, but the government cannot survive what Israelis are doing in Gaza. People are getting very angry, but also the pressure on him to mobilize his army and go forward to fight, to protest the Gazaeans, is refused. He is adamant in refusing the Gazaeans into the Sinai, as I said, because this will mean the end of Palestinians and the two-state solution. Furthermore, the Palestinians in Sinai would create serious national security problems for the government of Egypt. Now, let me add that there is a great feeling. No, this is not. And now that there is a shift, a rising tide, it's very it's very interesting that every day things are changing. From yesterday to today, there is a change in the American attitude, whereas before they refused to have anything else but to protect Israel. Now they're saying there is a tide of public and private pressure from European, Latin American, and other uh, capitals, even the United States, that are pressuring Israel to allow humanitarian pauses, and EU leaders have rejected the pleas from that brutal Netanyahu to lobby Egypt to open its border with Gaza and accept Palestinian refugees. This shift comes from the atrocities committed by Hamas to the pummeling of Gaza due to the magnitude of the Israeli assault. And now that we are hopefully approaching the day after, everyone is talking about the day after, let us speak to a former Fatah strongman in the Gaza Strip and listen to his vision of the future, which I think is one of the most imaginative and creative vision. Once Israel's war on Hamas ends, he says, the Gaza Strip should be governed by a technocratic government for two years, as it is an illusion that any single individual could take over on his own. You, if you want, you can remember what President Sadat, uh, Sadat's words when they offered him to take Gaza, said no to more refugees. Now, at the end of that period, which is the, the, the present war, which he believes would unify the splintered Palestinian factions, there should be elections based on a Palestinian state. This man I'm talking about is a former Fatah leader. He's called Muhammad Dahlan. He's a, a name that you should remember. So, there should be elections he says, based on a Palestinian state without defined borders. The borderless state could be backed by Arab countries, such as Egypt, Jordan, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Republic, and the United Arab uh, Emirates. After that, there should be international recognition by Israel and a final agreement with Israel. International recognition by the, Israeli, by the international community and a final agreement with Israel. The Hamas attack drew condemnation from many countries, yet Dahlan sees that this uh, war is an opportunity that could bring a Palestinian state, despite talks between Israel and Palestine, and Palestine having, you know, it has uh, the, the whole Palestinian Israeli question had died. Nobody talked about it. And now that there is this attack, everybody, all the world is talking about the Palestinian conflict. So Mr. Dahlan's vision 
is one of surprising hope amid the horrors of the fighting. Let us remember that he has connections, Mr. Dahlan, has connections on all sides of the conflict, with Israel, with Gaza people, with the Arabs, of course, and he also speaks very warmly of his relations with some senior Israeli figures. More immediately, Mr. Dahlan, who has returned from Egypt, has close ties with Egyptian President el-Sisi, and he has declared that he will not run for elections. But like all Arabs, you don't have to believe what he says. And yet, he firmly sets out his credentials for leadership. He has become a close advisor to the ruler of Abu Dhabi. He believes that Israel has destroyed the two-state solution. Listen to that, because this is what is quite new in his declaration. Everybody is talking about the two-state solution and who would accept and who would refuse. He believes that Israel has destroyed the two-state solution, and now is the time, he says, to strive to achieve the one-state solution. The real problem lies in the Israeli occupation. So uh, what I want to add for, at, the, at the end is one of the main things that we are asking for to end this, uh, this um, the Gaza saga is the liberation of the hostages. This is what all the international community is asking for, and it is part of what uh, Mr. Gargash has just said now in his, uh, in his speech. And I believe that he is quite right and that the international community should get together for that. Uh, <clears throat> I think it is enough. I have said enough. I hope you will have questions for that, because it's a new proposal to have somebody really come out with a suggestion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ramona, for your insightful deep thinking, and for your energy at the end of the day. You are clear with your ideas. You are very energetic. She was preparing since the morning, early morning. <laughs> <laughs> and she is challenging everybody at this late hour. So please write all your questions. I don't have questions for the panel. I am relying on you to ask them questions. But you brought a lot of ideas on, you know, uh, proposals on economics. You said enough. I think you said, you know, um, uh, issues of challenges to to the region and and to Egypt. And thank you for your clarity and in, in your intervention. Um, now the second, our second speaker is Abdurrahman Al Nayadi, and I will come. Him, he's the director of policy planning of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the UAE, and he will be speaking on the link between economic prosperity and security in the region, how increased economic cooperation can benefit the Middle East, given the leadership role of the UAE. We are all, of course, interested to listen to you, Abdurrahman. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, and thank you for the opportunity to be in this uh, very important uh, uh, workshop. Um, it's difficult to really discuss the region without uh, shedding light on what's happening in Gaza. And uh, I would try through my remarks, and I'm not going to take 15 minutes, but less, uh, to basically um, try and uh, put the wide lens on what's happening in our region and where we can be constructive. Um, the region has been uh, through crises uh, uh, moving from a crisis to another uh, for a long time. And uh, yet another big crisis with this magnitude happening divert our attention from every aspiration that we seek for our region and focus on trying to reach this humanitarian ceasefire and uh, the unhindered access of humanitarian aid. And then looking into the day after, as as uh, Dr. Muna has mentioned, the, the day after in which um, we know that the status quo prior to what happened is not uh, sustainable as well. Um, so I would try to uh, 
put a, put some diagnosis and speak about why we think prosperity is about of uh, is part of the regional security where we speak. Um, that's the, first of all the the way we look at it uh, in the UAE that uh, any regional security architect requires a strong component of economic prosperity. And why do we say that? I believe maybe you heard it in the last session uh, by Dr. Anwar Gargash mentioning uh, the same idea. And why do we say that? We say that because um, we live in a region uh, with uh, one of the youngest demographies. Uh, over 55% of our region right now is uh, less than 30 years old. Unemployment, 30% uh, of the unemployment rates in the region is uh, of people who have university degrees. Poverty is hitting one of uh, every four childs in the MENA region. And that's basically the, the statistics uh, that are online. This takes us to the importance of addressing these socioeconomic uh, factors if we want to reach a sustainable uh, peace and stability in the region. The, 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 so, the socioeconomic factors that led to uh, what so-called the Arab Spring since the 2011 uh, are not uh, addressed yet, uh, the socioeconomic factors uh, in the region through the multiple crises and the ramification of all the crises of the region has multiplied by COVID, by Ukraine, and now by the Gaza war. And that leaves us with uh, uh, the reality that any pursuit toward peace and stability requires to address the socioeconomic factors through trying to achieve economic uh, prosperity. So what do we need to do that? From our perspective, there are three main elements to pursue that. Number one is basically that regional countries need to move from the geopolitics of things into the geoeconomics of things and in engage uh, with um, uh, a mindset of e creating the economic denominators that we need um, in, in our region. Um, that requires, obviously, uh, uh, in many parts, the move from what we tried to do prior to what we see right now in Gaza, from de-escalation in the region uh, to cooperation in the region. And that move from de-escalation to cooperation requires a fundamental confidence building measures that many uh, regional security initiatives neglected in the past. Uh, these confidence building measures um, are very important in that exact uh, goal of moving from a fragile de-escalation to reach uh, a, a sustainable uh, cooperation uh, in the region. Number two, it's very necessary to address uh, extremism in all its manifestation. And why do we say that? Because we understand that extremism is something to be addressed. We understand that extremism uh, are con uh, is conducive to terrorism. We understand extremism is violent, but the extremism is also a disruptive, uh, has a disruptive impact on social development. So even if it's not that extremism that passes the threshold of violent, it still has an impact that jeopardizes uh, social development and it's important to be addressed. But how do we address it? Countering the extremist messages is not enough. Well, the way we should address it is in a longer term vision of enhancing ed education, educational systems, encouraging uh, and building resilience in society by, by educating our uh, youth in critical thinking and uh, also uh, working on women and youth empowerment. Um, and this is very important. Uh, we in the UAE, uh, if I'm going to speak of one of our uh, most important achievements in the last 50 years, 
a woman empowerment will be right there as a very clear achievement for our country. And why women empowerment? Because an empowered woman in a society create a healthy society and prevent extremism. And this is the way we look at it as a prevent, one of the most effective preventive measure against extremism. Number three uh, is uh, to provide an alternative narrative. There should be not, not only countering uh, extremist, extremist messages, but also providing an alternative. And the alternative requires the opportunities for our youth that we spoke about, which we, requires also the prosperity overall. These alternatives are the coexistence, the tolerance, the uh, freedom of religious practices, and building bridges and people-to-people -people engagement, all these alternatives are very important to, be, to, to achieve the, the alternative uh, narrative in the region. Um, and, and number three within that, uh, what we should do, uh, all what I said is something that could happen, but that also requires strong institutions. The region requires strong institutions and on the level, on the national level, on, on the, and also on the regional level. And that strong institutions uh, should be uh, the way forward to enhance the quality of life for our people. Because that's a, the sustainable way of doing it. Um, I think I'll, I'll stop here. I'll, I can take any question later on. Um, I try to be brief to diagnose and see the UAE perspective on how we see the region. Again, it's very difficult at this time to speak about uh, a future uh, optimistic uh, vision, but uh, I try to sum up uh, the wider lens on, on the region at this place. Thank you. Abdurrahman, thank you very much. Always going back to the basics, to the basic issues. We do provide a lot of sense, the education, so prepare the youth to the labor market. This is extremely important. Uh, empower people, empower women, that is a preventive measure for, um, you know, to counter the extremists, to provide alternatives. So it's not enough, you know, to say I have, um, I'm against this opinion, but then what is the alternative? Uh, tolerance, strong institutions, not only at national level, but regional level. There are a lot of questions. Please write down your questions and then you will have the opportunity to ask all those questions. Our um, third speaker, Raid Sharafuddin, I know Raid for so many years. He was with us at the board of the Arab Monetary Fund. Raid is, um, he was a, a still a central and commercial banker. He was former fi first vice governor of the Central Bank of Lebanon. I'm always proud of having him as a, as a good friend, and if, um, he, I know he has depth in, in the way he look at things and in terms of strategy, strategic thinking. And Raid will have open, his opening remarks on the socioeconomic impact of the dis displaced population crisis on countries in the region, and he will take Lebanon as a case. I think this is a very difficult issue for several countries in our region. It is sensitive, it is difficult, it is... Um, whenever you speak about it, it you know it becomes so um, you know. Um, and what Gurga said, you know, emotional also. And as we have heard him in in his um, the last uh, session, please write. Thank you, Dr. Hamidi. It's great to be here with you again in one of those beautiful sessions that you run. The uh, as Dr. Hamidi has said, the, uh, I was asked to talk about the socioeconomic impact of the Syrians, uh, Syrian displaced population crisis on Lebanon. Uh, in the introduction, I would say that the issue of the Syrians displaced in Lebanon evolved from a purely humanitarian one when the war broke out in 2011 to a massive call for a swift plan of action to repatriate them as they constitute an existential, quote unquote, threat to Lebanon's, again, quote, identity, image, and future. And I'm quoting the Minister of the Interior. Like Germany's 2014 versus 2018 reversing sentiments, populist rhetoric in Lebanon is recently echoing calls for self-protection, 
controlling measures against their movement in and even against their residential arrangements by heads of municipalities, governors, and the Minister of the Interior. <coughs> Excuse me. While others went all the way to facilitate their immigration by sea to Europe. Additionally, there are demands to review the modus operandi of the UNHCR, which is the United Nations Higher Commissioner uh, for Refugees, and the other relevant NGOs, and even terminate their operations altogether, especially with the unfulfilled financial pledges of the international community and the European Union's strong stance on the premature, quote unquote, return of the Syrians to Lebanon. This is compounded by the disputes among the cabinet members of Lebanon, of the, the, the caretaker government in Lebanon, which prevents it from convening and addressing this issue, while thousands of Syrians are infiltrating the, the northern and eastern common borders between Lebanon and Syria. To give you an idea, uh, this is the map of Lebanon. And uh, we have the northern, this is Syria from the northern borders and from the eastern borders. So we have uh, about uh, 387 kilometers of common borders. So this is really, that means it, I will get to some statistics later on while I'll be talking. So the Lebanese army arrested 25,000 Syrians during the first eight months of the year while the conflict has abated in Syria where regime is recapturing more key rebel-held areas and where most Arab countries started the process of re reproaching the administration, uh, the economic pressures there are mounting and pushing more citizens to flee the country into Lebanon, benefiting from the United Nations uh, current policy of offering them $300 per person monthly. Against this backdrop, Let's look, at, uh, let's look at the Lebanese economic or macro socioeconomic scene. Actually, we have been facing ourselves a stressful conditions resulting from multi-dimensional crisis that has been going through and aggravated by regional and global economic uh, turbulences. Lebanon's crisis emerged from a decade of regional turmoil on the one hand, particularly regarding the repercussions and risks of the Syrian crisis and the difficulties in public finances in terms of the budget deficit and the exacerbation of public debt and its service on the other hand. Uh, in the Q&A, if there's any q and I'll get to some numbers and statistics, but I'll, I'll skip that for now. But the inflationary and monetary financial factors that are really uh, pressured Lebanon more and more, the exchange rate devaluation, the, impal the imbalance in the balance of payment, uh, the government's uh, dumb decision to discontinue payments on all its outstanding U.S. dollar-denominated euro bonds on March 9, 2020, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic consequences and the Beirut port explosion factor of, of August uh, 2, 2020, the energy crisis, the fuel and economic effects, and on and on and on, has really put us in shambles. That is aggravated again with the presidential vacuum since little over a year, since October 30th, 2020. Uh, I'll get the statistics if there's any interest about it. Let's look at the numbers of the Syrians in Lebanon and the, how much they constitute as percentage of the Lebanese uh, population. And here comes the interesting part. We don't really know for sure how much they are. We have statistics, and we have statistics, and we have statistics. So we have statistics running for about 900,000, and we have statistics going to 2 million and 80,000. So look at that range. And I'll talk a little bit, a little bit about this variation in, in, in numbers. Because there are the, the registered population of the UNHCR, and there are not registered population, and there's the general security. Uh, the number that I will talk about here is the official number that the Lebanese uh, uh, general security, general director of the general security had talked about, which is 2,080,000. This is 30% of Lebanese 
So they constitute 30% of the Lebanese population. In addition to the new waves actually coming into Lebanon, and we'll see all kinds of, all kinds of videos of them coming in in hurts. Uh, well, the unofficial estimates indicate that the number of newly displaced people between June and July this year reached 15,000 per month. Uh, with a total population of 6.77, and this is, uh, you know, <laughs> we don't really know how much we are, how many people you are. So we had 6.77 million, according to the World Bank estimates, and 7.3 million people, inhabitants, according to official estimates. So this is what we have. Lebanon hosts the highest per capita concentration of refugees in the world. And uh, definitely, as you well know, we, in addition to the Syrian uh, brothers, we have the Palestinian brothers who are, we still have about 300,000 uh, Palestinians. But the Palestinians are considered refugees. So that's for legal issues. The uh, Syrians are not considered refugees, are dis considered displaced. And I have a, in, uh, here some, a, a table talks about the percentages of how much they constitute in our neighboring area. For example, Turkey, Jordan, Egypt, and Lebanon. And actually, the, in, in Turkey, they constitute 3.8. In Jordan, they constitute 5.9. In Egypt, they constitute 0 0.14. While in Lebanon, they constitute 36%. And based on the, you know, the numbers I took, I just played with some numbers. And in case they continue with their birth rate that they have, which is more than the Lebanese birth rate, actually we will be equal in by 2043. In 20 years, the Lebanese and Syrian population will be equal in Lebanon. The, uh, definitely the uh, Azud impact, just consider that the country is in shambles already. We are in deep uh, political, social, and economic problems. Not much infrastructure is is, is built and let alone ma maintained, let alone built. So all the pressures are, we have those guests of ours are using exact same roads, exact same electricity grid, exact same hospitals and uh, x-rays and what have you, transportation. Uh, so the, the education, communication, water and sanitation requirements. So when the same thing that hasn't, not much has been done on these infrastructural over the past several years. The World Bank estimates, a report estimates that the economic losses caused, caused by the Syrian conflict in terms of lower GDP is more than $1.1 billion in 2012, nearly $2.5 billion in 2013, and up to $3.9 billion in 2014. Actually, based on the Lebanese Central Bank, it is about $4.5 billion annually, so recurring. According to the estimates by the Ministry of Finance, between 2011 and 2018, the cost of the Syrian crisis inflicted on Lebanon amounted to $46.5 billion. So, uh, and there, as we have said, it's concentrated mostly in the sectors of health, education, energy, water, agriculture, and the environment in terms of solid waste, sanitation, and others. Um, some more, uh, I'll skip the statistics and uh, tell you where they are concentrated. Because of the proximity, as you would uh, expect, they are concentrated mostly in the east, like 36% in the eastern part of Lebanon. In the north, uh, uh, there are 25%, which is next to Syria. In the Beirut and Mount Lebanon, we call it, there are 27%, and they are less so in the southern part of Lebanon, which is 12%. In conclusion, in a speech before the United Nations General Assembly 10 years ago, delivered by the former High Commissioner for Refugees, Antonio uh, Guterres, the current Secretary General of the United Nations, he stated, and I'm quoting here, the burden of refugees on a small country like Lebanon is equivalent to the influx of about 15 million refugees to France more than 32 millions to Russia, and more than 71 millions to the United States. Well, this was 10 years ago. If we have to extrapolate, take the exact same numbers that he has talked. So now it's about 27 million refugees in France, 
61 million refugees in Russia and 140 million refugees in the United States. Well, certainly there are some positive implications about the Syrian presence in Lebanon in terms of labor market. And uh, we can definitely capitalize on it. And this is something, one of the ideas that I've talked about in the United Nations uh, uh, personnel several years ago. But our government did not really, were not, were, was not interested at that time. This was about, about 2016. Unfortunately, they want to pressure the, the, the Syrians just like what they pressured the Palestinians. They want to make their life looks like hell, so that they will just leave as much as possible and as soon as possible. So they were, our government of 2016 was not ready to accommodate any of the ideas that we've talked about for Lebanon to take advantage of them and for really, uh, which is in the, in the best interest of our uh, community and theirs. Thank you very much. Thank you, right so much. And we have to give it to the Lebanese, their education and your um, skills of the Lebanese. Um, you are everywhere in, in our region participating. Also the vibrant private sector, even though, you know, all those difficulties, you go to Lebanon and as if the private sector is in, you know, as if it were isolated, which is not isolated, but it's very vibrant. You know, the good thing about this panel is we go from, um, you know, uh, colleagues into the parliament, to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, to ambassadors, to central bankers, and then to scientists. So let me also, our fourth speaker, Ernesto Demiani, is a professor at Khalifa University for the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. He is also the director of Center for Cyber Systems. He, he will be, um, his remarks, uh, the opening remarks will be about trust and governance issues of multi-regional uh, de deployment of AI. Please, Ernest. Oh, thank you very much. I, had, uh, I was the only one, apparently, who had taken the opportunity that was given to us to, to present a couple of slides. I don't know if they are, they are available or not. I will just try to press this button to see whether this is the case. But if not, I'm, uh, I can, okay, here they are. So basically, uh, I really listened with a lot of interest to what was said before me. And uh, as uh, you said, I'm not an economist and I'm not, uh, but I'm very much interested, of course, in the economy of uh, the processes, especially the processes, large scale processes and the regional processes in terms of, uh, you know, large scale supply chains business processes that involve multiple countries. And I'm interested from the point of view of the underlying technology. And so I would like just to add a few words on what could be the day after of, you know, uh, a deglobalization that is taking place. And there are two, two words that I want to say before starting to show you a couple of slides. And the two words are words that are very fashionable in Europe. Uh, and uh, I also heard them in the region here a lot. One is decoupling, and the second one is de-risking. So what is decoupling from the point of view of a technologist? Introducing redundancy. So if a part of a process is not feasible due to some conditions that happen, for example, a supplier is no longer available, and then you want to, to have a second sourcing, right? So you need to have this second alternative part of business processes. And this is called decoupling. You are introducing, mis of course, you are, uh, in a sense, uh, paying more. You, the, you, you won't be at an optimal solution just because you want to decouple. You want to be able to cut out some parts if this uh, is needed. And the second is de-risking. So the fact that I wanted to put risk as a first-class citizen in my decisions. And these are decisions that, from the technology point of view, are decisions that are about business processes and supply chains. So uh, this is what I wanted. Very interesting picture that we have in front of us of, uh, you know, deglobalization and uh, arising, uh, you know, areas of conflict. And of course, this the impact is that we have a technology platform that needs to handle decoupling and de-risking. These are the two words. So, in a sense, the problem is that we, our platforms, we run them based on data. So supply chains are optimized every day. Cargo shipments are optimized every day. Regional, uh, of course, processes are, and inter-regional processes are particularly important in this region. We are in a place which is the hub. 
the hub between the East and the West. So I don't want now to enter into this from the point of view of the economist or the politician, because it's really not my bailiwick. But from the point of view of the technologies, this makes a very fascinating place. On the other hand, the problem is that normally we have to optimize jointly, meaning that we have to solve jointly some problems of optimization to run global airlines, to gl run global cargo, to run the uh, business processes. And in order to do that, the big problem is that the, the notion is that we must have some joint strategy. The actors that will take decision together need to be able to basically trust each other enough to do joint optimization of large scale regional and inter-regional processes. So uh, my problem is that uh, we have all, most of the tools of the technology tools we give to decision makers are based on this assumption. They will trust each other enough to make a joint decision because this is a, a major, uh, a major part of any, of any. So in a sense, well, I, 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 being a scientist, well, you see, I have a nice picture. This is called the Pareto frontier. Pareto was a, uh, you know, so the, in the decision making, you, you tend to find uh, those points which basically will be a sort of a compromise so everyone can agree on them with a minimum of, of, of damage or a minimum of penalty. The problem is that in order to do that, you must know, have a joint knowledge of the data, of the information uh, that you are jointly taking a decision on. And the problem is that in this situation, we, we are uh, less likely to be able to do that. The worsening, the worst part, and now let me, inject a bit of AI. I hope I'm not boring you too much. The worst part is that most of the optimization decisions today are taken by systems. Humans have a role in starting, have a role in sharing the information, but then the notion, for example, of optimization, supply chain, we did a master class here in the, at Khalifa University together with a number of European universities on the pharma supply chain at the time of COVID. So basically, you need to optimize the pharma supply chain to be able to, uh, for example, to do the vaccination rates that are needed for the population. And this is something that you can do if you uh, uh, basically tell each other uh, what are the, uh, the sizes of the warehouse, what are the availability of the, of the uh, instruments. So the problem is that these days, optimization are done using systems, and they are do done using systems that are a little bit difficult to, to open and identify. I know there has been a session in this conference specifically on this topic in the, in the previous uh, days and uh, by a colleague of uh, uh, Khalifa, and I want to underline this notion. We are accustomed to optimize, trusting each other, putting the data in a box, and then running a sort of a, you know, uh, the, the, the algorithm and getting out for a solution that will bind us all but the problem is that the data may, or the information, the trust level may be decreasing much in this region specifically in the near future. So the big uh, uh, processes may be, in a sense, less easy to optimize. So there is a problem eh, of failure happens. And we may be seeing in the future our models, we do run simulation models, of course, of this. And our models say that we may see low accuracy of the joint models we may see fast model degradation, so a number of assumptions that led joint running of processes may be sort of show uh, that uh, lower performance in the, in, the next, uh, in the next future, and the mutual trust, mutual trust will become scarce. So, scarcer then. So, this is what, from the technology point of view, I wanted to highlight. This is not just political, this is also uh, technological because of the technology platforms, and this has been discovered in Europe for the Ukra with the Ukraine war, and the, with the push for the risking and the decoupling the supply processes that involve certain countries. So this is something that, again, uh, I would like to highlight uh, to you here. So uh, let me just, uh, let me just uh, uh, skip all this part, because I had a sort of a tried to, and I want, let me just arrive to this discussion point. We were trying to do a second digital revolution that was deploying large-scale joint optimization, artificial intelligence especially, across markets. We were trying to do it in this region specifically. We're still trying to do it. Uh, it's similar to the introduction of the internet in the 90s, but the, in the sense for how pervasive it is. 
The problem is that the introduction of the internet was done in a moment in which there was a globalization type of uh, trend. Everybody was trusting each other or could pretend to trust each other. The deployment of uh, um, AI and the joint optimization of large-scale processes need to take place in a situation in which there is not enough trust. So we need to find another way to, uh, to take joint decisions in order uh, to uh, handle this limited trust that we have. Uh, of course, technically I could show you how op optimization in a non-trustworthy environment could take place. But I just wanted for the moment to highlight this, this thing. It will be the day after, because whatever the, 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 uh, the future brings, certainly the globalization in a mutual trust environment is going to be, uh, I believe, a memory <laughs> of the past. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ernesto. We, in economics, we did borrow so much from science, and most of the terminologies you have said we use them in economics, but I hope we use them the right way. De-risking with correspondent banking. So this is the way we have been using it. But in science, it's being used differently. Our fifth speaker, he was um, Francois Francois Goet. He was yes, he was the former ambassador of France to the UAE and to Saudi Arabia. I'm surprised today he speaks very good Arabic. When he was in Saudi, he didn't we didn't know. So probably in our meetings you were, did understand what we were saying about you and we didn't know you speak that good Arabic. Uh, anyway, he will be speaking about social challenges facing our region. Please, Francois. Shukran, said Rais. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, I'm honored to be here today at the World Policy Conference alongside esteemed panelists, including my, my friend Mona, whom I am very happy to, to see after so many years, on experts to discuss the pressing economic and social issues facing the Middle East. Having served, as you rightly said, Mr. Chairman, as former French ambassador to the United Arab Emirates 20 years ago and Saudi Arabia more recently, among other posts in North Africa. I have had the privilege to witness and engage with the complexities of the Middle East. My diplomatic career in this area has allowed me to experience the region's intricate dynamics. It is from this point of view that I wish to address briefly before you the challenges and opportunities that the Middle East faces. I will highlight seven key points that I believe are crucial in understanding the nature of Middle East societies in the coming decades, drawing from my experiences and encounters in the region. First, economic diversification. It is of paramount importance in the Middle East. Many countries in the region have been heavily reliant on oil and gas revenues in the past. For instance, in Saudi Arabia, oil exports have historically accounted for more than 90% of the country's budget revenue. The recent push to diversify economies beyond hydrocarbons as seen in the Saudi Vision 2030, aims to reduce this reliance. However, it poses challenges in terms of workforce skills on creating sustainable industries. I would uh, add also, the, of course, before being in Saudi Arabia, I, I was posted in, in Abu Dhabi, and uh, the Emirates have been a pioneer in this, in this respect, in, in terms of diversification of their economy. The uh, point two is pertaining to youth empowerment. It was uh, mentioned by our friend Abdurrahman in his Mudakhala. Uh, the Middle East has, it has been said, a young and growing population. Therefore, youth empowerment is central to addressing social and economic issues. In Egypt, 
over 60% of the population is under the age of 30. Governments must therefore invest in education skills, education skills development and job creation to harness the demographic dividend rather than face potential unrest. This is an imperative. Point three, women's rights and participation. It was also addressed by Abdelrahman. The role of women in the Middle East, as you know, is evolving, is changing, a transformation I have closely followed, particularly in KC and also before that in the EAU. Empowering women economically and politically will not only enhance social justice, but also stimulate economic growth. Reforms in family laws, labor laws and political representation are essential. In Saudi Arabia, the lifting of the driving ban for women and the increasing participation of women in the labor force have significantly improved gender equality. Four, social and political inclusion. Societies in the Middle East are diverse with different ethnic, religious, and sometimes tr tribal communities. For the government of those countries, promoting social and political inclusion is vital to maintaining stability. Ensuring representation and addressing grievances are key to preventing conflicts. For example, in Lebanon, Power sharing agreements in the past among religious groups have been to some extent instrumental in maintaining stability and political inclusion, although to this day the relevance of this system of distribution of power of governments is put in question. Five, regional cooperation. The Middle East is also a mosaic of nations with complex relationships. Increased regional cooperation is essential to address shared challenges such as water scarcity, refugees, as mentioned by our friend, and regional security. Diplomacy should always prevail over conflicts. The war that is raging between Israel and Hamas, as we are speaking today, must reinforce our convictions in this respect. Six, sustainable development. The region is facing increasing environmental challenges, including climate change. Sustainable development practices are crucial for long-term stability and prosperity. Investing in renewable energy and sustainable agriculture is paramount. The UAE has been also a pioneer in this respect. Saudi Arabia is also now uh, leading country in, 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 this, uh, in this prospect. And last 7.7, 7, digital transformation. The digital revolution is reshaping societies worldwide and the Middle East is no exception. Embracing technology and fostering innovation can drive economic growth. The United Arab Emirates, for instance, has been also a pioneer more than 20 years ago uh, when it, uh, it has established free zones like Dubai Internet City, by instance, encouraging technology startups on digital innovation. In conclusion, to, be, uh, to stay within the limits of the seven minutes which were imparted to me. <laughs> no, 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 less than you, Mona. <laughs> In conclusion, by addressing these challenges, national authorities, in a logic of win-win partnership with the West, including France, my country, but also reliable investors can shape a more stable and prosperous Middle East, fostering peace, prosperity, cooperation, and a broader respect for human rights. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to for the insights of my fellow panelists. Ambassador Francois, Shukran Jazeel, and thank you so much Afwan, for your, thank you so much for your um, comprehensive remarks. This is uh, very much, <coughs> um, it, you know, it, it discusses the issues of the region, the challenges that's facing our region. The youth is is, a, is an issue that 
should be paid attention to. Um, and thank you very much for your participation. Our our next um, sixth speaker is Mamdou Karakochwa. This is as good as I can pronounce your last name. And please excuse me if I didn't do it well. Um, true, but it's a, a bit longer one than I am used to. Uh, which is a very nice name, by the way. I'm, I have been trying and, uh, um, uh, you know, I'm training myself, but somehow I did not get it yet. I will next time. Uh, Mamdouh will speak about the economic factors that will impact the region and shape, shape the region's economy, whether it is energy dynamics or prices, public debt, capital flow, excess supply of labor, technology, and the productivity. So we'll speak about all the issues that previous speakers spoke about, and, and you, will be, you will be limited to the same time. Thank you. I will keep it short, don't worry. I mean, I won't keep it short, but within 15 minutes, for sure. Thank you, Chair. It's good to be back in Abu Dhabi. It's good to be back with World Policy Conference friends and colleagues, so thank you. Um, now, of course, this is all happening under the tragic shadow of what's happening, transpiring in Gaza. So I shared the sadness. In Turkey, we all shared the sadness, and you can feel it in the people. It's very real. Moving to the actual substance of my remarks, I will be at the intersection of geopolitics and geoeconomics, but more to the geoeconomic side. Uh, for the last few years, actually, we were on the same panel, I think, last year. We were, I was more on the geopolitical aspect of things, but now, uh, the, today, we go get into economics. So of course, Abdurrahman did a great job of sort of painting that picture, then the intersection. Uh, so I'll try to build on that. I will sort of challenge him maybe on a few things. Uh, you know, when you are sort of marginally a part of the Middle East, I am Middle Eastern, but, you know, just sort of associate, one needs to be very humble. I'll try to do that. But as a speaker, I need to provoke a little bit, so I'll take a bit of a risk. So forgive me if I just don't get that balance right. Now, I, when I was thinking about this presentation, I just sort of thought back, and it was exactly 10 years ago, in 2013, that I was asked by the Allied command of NATO to write a piece on regional economics. So I thought, okay, economics, geosecurity, this has been with me for some time. And I thought that would be a good reference point to take for myself. So that's the past 10 years. And that gives me some feel, at least I try to get tease out a feel for the next 10 years, where things can go from here. When I look back at those 10 years, uh, the, 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 the reference, the, what I got out of the, my first analysis in 2013 was that the fundamental, for me, issue of development in the region is trust. The trust between its people and its governments. And that trust was fractured. And how do you rebuild it when there is so much pent up frustration and impatience in the people. I mean, well-meaning governments, even if you try to deliver, execute fast, when people have been waiting for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, it's very difficult. The challenge is immensely difficult. That's what I got. And um, with that, sort of, you know, I st when I think about it, I mean, I, if I divide the problem into two pieces, one is, will these economies grow? Will they create wealth? That's one question, the aggregate wealth. The second question is, will these economies put in place the mechanisms where the created wealth will be distributed to the society? It's the distribution, the engagement of the citizens that seems to be the problem in the Middle East. It is the creating wealth. I mean, you know, you compare it with other regions in the world, it's not the best, but it's okay. It is the distribution, getting the people, getting the young people to be a part of this is the challenge. That's the problem. So, Looking back uh, over the past 10 years, I wonder you know, whether things have progressed in the past 10 years. Has the region come a long way? And when I think about that, um, the answer is not all that positive. I mean, the unemployment is high. Youth unemployment, still high. Informal economy, still huge. Um, women participation, still very low. Uh, the, quality of jobs, they're still 
low skill, low paid, low tech jobs. Not much change on that front. So, and then the weak private sector. I mean, the, the, the dream has always been to get the private sector going so that the private sector absorbs these new, bright, well-educated people, but it's not happening. It hasn't really happened to the extent that we all hoped. And this is not because the governments, the bureaucrats, the technocrats didn't try. Everybody tried. I, mean, I think well-meaning people, very intelligent people, are trying. They've been trying. And you know, when I look back, I go beyond the 10 years. I remember, you know, I don't, I do sort of remember the 90s and 90s and, and 2000s definitely. The it was the heyday of neoliberalism, and IMF was in the region. You know, there were programs with Egypt, with Morocco. So all this reform talk of you know, get rule of law, governance, uh, reform the trade sector, reform the, ex you know, it was all on the table. We've, we've had this before. And this, until 2010, I think we had quite a bit of it. And then the last decade, of course, we had all these other realities. We had the aftermath of the Lehman crisis. We, it was the aftermath of the Arab Spring. Uh, I still call it the Arab Spring. Um, and, you know, one after another, so this 10 years, didn't really alleviate all these problems, but it wasn't for lack of trying. I think people have been trying. And I put the pro problem in sort of two different baskets. One, of, one set of problems is, as I said, there's this repetition of sort of their well-meaning and accurate, I mean, sort of well-targeted platitudes, but they don't go far. You know, when you say governance has to be improved, sure. Rule of law, sure. I mean, I, we all want that in my country as well. But it's the how. I mean, how, how does it happen? How will it happen? And we don't really see those inc even incremental steps getting in that direction. That is one bucket of repeating sort of platitudes, right platitudes, but that don't get you to the result. Then there's another set where actually things were done, but th we figured out that you do the policy, you actually implement the policy, but you don't get the result. And some of those examples, as I sort of delved into this, is, for example, I realized that in the last 10 years, number of years of education have increased in the region in many countries. But that did not translate to better jobs, uh, high, higher pay. So those better educated young people didn't end up getting good jobs, which is strange. So the thing was done. Education, there was investment in education, but the result isn't there. Then you look at, I mean, the, we always talked about the bloated public sector. The Egyptian public sector employs so many people. Egypt has actually reduced the number of, the, the percentage of employment in the public sector. That's progress. But unfortunately, it seems, I mean, you would know better, of course, but it seems from what I read is that the people who were, you know, the, the jobs that were left to the private sector were displaced not with formal sort of, uh, again, high tech, high value added uh, private sector jobs, but they were substituted with low skill informal sector jobs. So people, the new job opportunities that were released from the state were not picked up by the sophisticated private sector. So that isn't working. That link doesn't work. So I mean, Egypt did, Egypt government did what it had to do but the other piece isn't in place. Then we look at FDI, the foreign direct investment. There is some FDI, FDI coming in, but the shift from the real estate, construction, energy to the more labor intensive industries, eh, not happening as well. And the worst thing or the worrying thing uh, is FDI. We always hope that when a multinational comes for with a green field in a country that it will sort of ripple around. People will work this multi with this multinational. This multinational will hire people. Skills will flow to the other uh, companies. That doesn't seem to happen. That link isn't working. So things are, we're doing things. We're implementing these policies, but not getting the results. Something is wrong. So that's, you know, that's, that's the sort of uh, the, the, what I teased out of the last 10 years. That brings me to now. So what happens in the next 10 years? Will we, in 10 years, if we all gather here again, 2033, will we again be saying, ah, oh, you know, it, it just didn't happen. We tried, and we didn't get the results. High unemployment, low women participation. I hope that's not the case, and we have to figure out a way. Now, uh, 
what is different about now? What is different about now? What I'm feeling, I mean, uh, our chair has introduced the headwinds coming our way at, for this region as well. We have the energy transition. We don't know what's going to happen to the oil price. We have the reasonably, you know, relatively lower global growth coming our way. That will impact the region. We have probably, after 10, 15 years, positive real interest rates coming. That will hit the public debt of these countries. So, you know, there's, there's, there's the climate issue. There will be droughts. There will be food insecurity. Food prices going up. So the next 10 years, if it is business as usual, doesn't look any better than the past 10 years. So we, we really have a problem. So, you know, I've given so many negative messages. What am I saying? Uh, you know, I don't obviously have the, the, the clean answer, but I'll just, you know, sort of try something. The one thing we know is we're probably, you know, you go to any meeting and we're in the midst of transitions. We, the, country, the globe is going through multi-layer transitions, polycrises, so on and so forth. That's the talk. So that means, I mean, every transition is uncertainty, risk, but at the same time, every transition, it's a discontinuity. Sort of cards are reshuffled and you can find ways to position, reposition yourself. So there is more room for strategic play when cards are reshuffled. That's probably where we are. That's what it feels like. And what am I saying? Let me give a bit more substance to it. One, the geometry of the world is definitely changing. It has already changed. So we were actually in a world of globalization. Everybody was integrating. There was a development model for that. You bring the rural population to the urban. They manufacture. You sell, export to the world. That was the development model. Not working anymore. And because that's not the world we are in. Instead, the world we are in, let's call it a fragmented world, brings in other geometries. It is the French shoring idea. So you look at the map, and it seems you know, Europe should French shore in this region. That, that's just a no-brainer when you look at the map. Not happening at the moment. But the strategic discussion, dialogue, effort, I think it is there. It, is, it can be done. In a narrower sense, the energy integration with Europe is happening. You look at the Morocco-UK X-Links uh, sort of the under ocean uh, cable, impressive, a, a very impressive undertaking. The Italian Tunisian interconnection, impressive. Uh, the Algerian Spain, interesting. So that is happening. Some integration is happening. That's a different paradigm. Then you look at another geometry it is the Chinese BRI versus the American Indian Europe corridor. So, you know, we have all these investments coming your way. Can these countries in the region? look at this reshuffling and come up with a strategy and then focus on that strategy that will give them the push, the jump start, the leverage, where the communities, the societies will feel, okay, this is the new vision, the new direction we are going. That, I think, might be an opportunity. But it will not, it's not easy. I mean, I'm obviously uh, you know, just trying to imagine things. I'll just finish by giving one little sort of example from my humble history and experience. You know, in my 30s, uh, I was given this great task of founding and managing Turkey's first technology park. So it was a development project, actually. And the idea was to get European, American high-tech companies to come to Turkey to work with the local tech companies. And that's what we want, actually, from FDI in the region. And what I noticed after that, what I got out of that experience, yes, sure, rule of law, good governance, all those things, they need to be in place. They can really make your life miserable if they're not in place. And they did make, like, Mike, they did make my life miserable, but it is not enough. It is definitely not enough. You need to have an agile vision. You need to have leadership that knows that vision and can sort of maneuver with it. And you need to make sure that everybody in that community, in that society, knows about that vision. It is not, you, we cannot work with uh, one-size-fits-all policies. These need to be agile. These need to be sort of flexible. But you need institutions and institutional actors who can actually deliver, who can execute, who are given initiative, yet guidance. It is that kind of a structure works. So basically, to wrap up, I think if we look at this problem as business as usual, the next 10 years, it does not look good to me. 
but it is it seems to be full of strategic opportunities for the region. The region may well uh, find ways to negotiate, uh, find, you know, just, just find balance with Europeans, Americans, uh, Indians, Chinese to, 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 to deliver. But it will require a different set of policy thinking, policy making, and I hope that happens And the next time we meet in 10 years. I hope we'll have better stories to tell each other. Thank you. Mandua, thank you so much. We have one more speaker. Please write down your question. But Mandua, thank you. You have covered so many issues. Unemployment, informal economy, it's an issue. Economic reform, whether would it work or not, that would depend whether the patient in the intensive care or outside the intensive care before you start the reform program. Education, yes. There are very good educated people. They graduate, they go to Europe, they find good jobs, they participate. You, you have to have a private sector. You have to have a vibrant private sector. And um, whether the government is crowding in or crowding out, the, the, the private sector is something uh, you know we can speak about. But you know, our last but not least speaker is Dr. Kamal Abdullah, he's managing director and CEO of Canal Sugar. It's a UAE Egyptian multi-billion dollar agriculture and industry group in Egypt that aims to ensure Egypt's self-sufficiency in sugar. He will be speaking about water, food security, issues food security was an important issue for, for financial institutions like our during the pandemic and you know, at that time, we had meetings, we received calls saying, listen, if people will go to the streets, it's because of food security. So let us pay a lot of attention and we were financing balance of payment deficits over the last three years. He will be covering those issues and their relevance also to national security, economic and social stability of the region. Please, Dr. Kamal. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first time I heard the word intifada, I was a kid in school. And uh, it was in the 70s, 1977. And it was the first bread intifadas. Uh, they happened in Egypt on Lebanese. And uh, there was a attempt by the Sadat, uh, at the time, the Sadat government to increase the price uh, or remove the subsidies over food, uh, over bread. And there were demonstrations and riots. And it was called the bread intifadas of 77, resulting in over 100 dead, 100 people dead. Followed by 1984, the Tunisia Intifada, again, bread Intifada, again, 70 people dead, riots in the streets, and again, over governments uh, trying to remove some subsidies on food. Uh, food security now is a buzzword. Uh, I've been in this field now for about 20 years, mostly from the private sector, having worked in, in UAE, uh, as well as in the region, Saudi, Qatar, and now Egypt, working on food security issues. Uh, the good news and the bad news, food security now is a buzzword used by the taxi driver eating a falafel sandwich as much as used by a government official talking about policies. Uh, the new buzzword will be, and we are giving you a heads up, it will be water uh, security and water stress. This will be the buzzwords that uh, we'll be hearing about. But let me connect the two. In the 80s, as I said, we had the riots, the antifadas over food. So governments came with their triple A you know, availability, affordability, accessibility. Bring the food where, no matter where, Argentina or Australia or Romania, north, south, east, west, subsidize it to the people and just make it available so they will not go and demonstrate on the street. What happened is that we end up with a different problem. We end up with a problem that said, this is not enough. These people now are getting food, but unhealthy food. And so now they are becoming diabetic they're having health problems, and now they're living longer, and now we as governments have to spend money treating them uh, because they will live till 80, but they will need a lot of insulin shots, God forbid. So that creates a different move in, in food security. And we moved from availability and affordability, saying we need to move to wellness. The challenge, though, on both fronts, to subsidize it, you need money, but we are running budget deficits, and if we add the health cost that we have to pay for which is not an option, then the food security bill is becoming massive. And hence, we moved into food wellness by arguing you need local production of healthy food, but much more important than production. Another buzzword you'll hear besides water uh, security is consumption, healthy consumption. 
uh, regretfully, we throw about 30% of the food we produce. And even in our consumption patterns are unhealthy, not only among the poor, but among the rich in terms of consumption uh, of food. How do we link this to water? Water is the biggest challenge now in food security in the region, in the Middle East. If we look at where our water is coming from, 60% come from outside, direct Middle East. We mentioned Turkey, is it in or out? Assuming it's out, Turkey, in terms of the water uh, rivers that are leading into Iraq and into Syria, the big issue of water accessibility by the Iraqis, Iraq, which used to be the birth of agricultural civilization, the rivers, Milad, Mabain, and Nahrain, they don't have enough water anymore due to the dams and other things, procedures done by their neighbors. Egypt now, we all remember Egypt, Sudan, and the Nile, but the Nile does not start in Egypt, not even in Sudan. We have to go back to the other countries where it starts, uh, who are all now building dams to control access to those waters. So if we are looking at waters coming from rivers, it's problematic. Water coming from above the rain, it's almost non-existing. And if it comes, it floods, it even uh, creates problems rather than solves. So where is the remaining water, which is now the most interesting part? Underground, the aquifer. Whether the aquifer in Saudi or in UAE, the aquifer in uh, Egypt, Libya. Of course, we remember the big rivers that they wanted to do in Libya, as well in Tunisia and all that, uh, the desert. It's relatively the same aquifers, because only divided by the, by the Red Sea. And on those, at least personally, I have a lot of experience. In Egypt, we have a farm the size of Singapore, the size of Bahrain, and the only water we have is the underground water. And we are working hard modeling the aquifer, modeling the use of the water. We have now over 200 wells that will go to about 400 wells. We dig as deep as 450 meters up to 1,250 meters, reaching the Nubian waters. Now, of course, we are a large company. We have modeling. We have for every well that we put to use, for every 10 of them, we have one which is sensor and monitoring the water. And yes, the water is dropping alarmingly. But we also work with 6,000 local farmers, and we know that most of the people in Egypt who are in agriculture, uh, it's very easy for them to put a well without a lot of management of these, of these wells. So when we look on the sources of water, we have a problems. We are sorting it in the UAE and in the GCC by using diesel. In Egypt, in uh, UAE, for example, one third of the water is coming from uh, diesel. But diesel is expensive and it's not a long-term solution. Okay. When we are looking at uses of water, most of the water use is now in agriculture, but we have different challenges. We don't have enough regulation on how to use and when to use and where to use. We are abusing water in every way when it comes to consumption and use of the water. For example, if you take uh, sugar beets, which you use in sugar, you can use as little as 2,600 metric cube of water for every faddan, but probably most people use between six to 8,000, three times as much as they need to use in water. Okay, now there are different technologies that are there to use it. I won't get too much into the technical aspects of it, but I wanna come back to the three critical questions. Do we have the, uh, reliable, efficient delivery of water in the region? We don't. It's getting there. Technology is helping a lot. Thank God for technology, we are now doing more self-sufficiency production of food in the region, but still that's not enough. Are the uh, uh, water resources managed sustainably and efficiently? Uh, when we are talking about aquifers, underground water, it should last us for 200 years plus. When you're looking not at the quantity, but also the quality of the underground water, it's more and more salty water, which you cannot then use in agriculture, and that's a problem. Now, of course, there are technological developments trying to use salty water to produce agricultural products, but that's, that's not enough. And probably the third biggest issue is our water risk being recognized and mitigated. And again, the, the answer, regretfully, is not enough. So yes, we are delivering waters better. Yes, we are using technology to use less water time after time. But when it comes to the government side and to the working with the private sector, not only with the large private sector companies, but also with the thousands and thousands of farmers, we have a lot of issues there. And are we mitigating and preparing for the risks using of water? We're not sure we're there. 
many people, uh, whether Lebanon and Israel's uh, you know, conflict over water use, whether it will be Turkey, Syria, and Iraq, whether it will be Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt, we do expect the, the next war, God forbid, to be over water. And if it's over water, that means it's over food. And if it's over food, it means over nutrition, wealth, and wellness. I try to keep my comments brief because I know we are running out of time for discussion. And I will leave any other uh, uh, points for questions. Thank you, Mr. Thank, Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Kamil. This is a, a very timely issue. It's a very challenging issue. It's uh, water is a very big issue with the climate change issue also food security issues, but let me please, um, if there are questions or com if you have comments, make them uh, uh, as short as you can. If you have a question, uh, please let us know to whom that question is directed to, and please introduce yourself first. Go ahead. Yep. <clears throat> My name is Pei Emerson. I'm an entrepreneur in education, and I think education is one of the most important things. As you said, one size doesn't fit all. A trend in education today is that you are getting in more and more private entrepreneurs to work alongside with governments. I'm running at present 100 schools with 35,000 students in, in six countries. I have one school in Jeddah with 1,000 students perceived to be one of the best in Jeddah. I had very interesting discussions with the Minister of Education here just before the pandemic because we see enormous potential to go in with private investments and do education here. So that's just my reflection when we talk about this, make sure to use the private entrepreneurs. I've also been part of a big UNESCO study, Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Peace and Education in, in 50 countries, and you show that there are more and more alternative ways of doing education that could complement and be a catalyst to a change in providing better education. Go ahead, please. You take it? Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. I'm Hiro Akita from Tokyo. So uh, I'm not the Middle East expert, but uh, since I'm from Asia, based on the experience in Asia, I really agree that the economic in inter-regional economic cooperation is very, very key to sustain or avoid conflict and maintain the peace. Based on that, I have a question to Mr. Nal, uh, Al Niyadi, and if possible, I'd like to ask a question to Chairman. And my question is uh, this. In order to uh, deepen inter-regional economic cooperation, maybe ideally, Israel should be included because they have a high tech, they are economic power. But I, might, I wonder if, how do you see the potential or possibility in long run that Israel will be included in the Middle East regional economic integration and cooperation? And related to that, how, how about Iran in that context? Thank you. Thank you. Let me, let me start with Abdurrahman, then Dr. Muna, on that question. I'm not going to answer. It's good that I'm not speaking in this session. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll answer it in two, two elements. Uh, the first one is the idea of including all regional states, including Israel, within the uh, concept of uh, regional uh, economic integration. And that has already, uh, we've seen some uh, initiatives on that. Uh, going uh, back since the Abrahamic Accords, there were the I2U2, there were the Negev Forum, and they're, wo they're all directed into reaching that economic prosperity uh, goal in which it enhances the quality of life for the people and show that there, is, uh, there could be a change of narrative in the region. That's, that's uh, the concept of, of uh, these many laterals uh, as um, too many laterals that came out of uh, the idea of the Abrahamic Accords to start with. Uh, the other the other element uh, uh, I, I would like to to mention is is uh, in term of compartmentalizing uh, we um, do not see eye to eye with many countries when it comes to politics but that's not a prevention from uh, pursuing economic uh, mutual interest 
And that's where we engage all countries. From the UAE perspective, we engage all countries in the region. We have dialogue with everybody. We, bu we build bridges with everybody, including Iran. And the idea is to expand on that mutual interest ground to achieve the, the economic prosperity that we pursue. And maybe a part of your experience is basically that. But that requires also two main things. One is um, uh, an agreed upon principles and values, values and principles of non-interference, of respect of sovereignty, of cooperation, and also uh, requires uh, pragmatism and compartmentalizing uh, your engagement with countries. So you uh, work on what could be a mutual ground of, uh, of interest and you avoid uh, tackling straight away the divergence of views. How, however, uh, that also doesn't mean just uh, being fixated on getting the low hanging fruit. You also need constant dialogue to deal with the divergence of views in the longer term. Thank you. I was it's wondering if he, if he wants it. If he wants. Uh, talking about education, education is one of the main themes we have in Egypt, is to concentrate on education. I don't think we do that enough. The, uh, what is allotted to education is far less than what it should be. So words are good, but the execution is not. So now talking about Iran and about Israel. Iran, as you know, Iran and Saudi Arabia were, had an entente through China, which was very good and which was accepted by everyone. So it was the first uh, uh, approach to, China, to Iran in the Arab world. This is one. The other one is Israel. As you know, Israel and Egypt have done the peace process now for 30 years, and it has been sustained. We are very, very scared that this new tragedy might fragilize the treaty with Israel. Uh, I, I will make a comment, and there are questions here and there, and here and there. Um, you know, we have two types of, um, of meeting at our leadership. One focuses on political issues, the other one on economic issues. If you take all the economic summits, uh, uh, which we pay a lot of attention in my institutions, they are all successful. They agree on the issues, and we go and implement. For example, in, in, in Kuwait, they have agreed on the importance of uh, putting a mechanism for cross-border payments. We at the Arab Monetary Fund actually initiated a, a new institution pays, you know, executing that objective. In Saudi Arabia, they agreed to increase the capital of the financial institutions. It has been implemented. So we, you, are, you will take all the su summits at the level of the leaders. Whenever, whenever it is economic summit, very successful, agreement, you know, we ended up as our culture, kissing each other, hugging each other, etc. Whenever it's a political summit, they will leave without shaking hands. So we need to pay a lot of attention to economic. What would, how Europe got together? Europe was in, in fight. They got together on the grounds of economic and financial issues, economic ties. This is what we need to pay attention to. And lately at the Arab Monetary Fund, we have been advising, you know, certain um, um, relevant ministers on, on those issues. Let us please focus on economic and financial issues. And I think we are no different. We are no exception. We can agree if we would. And, and the, uh, for example, el electricity connectivity. It, we have made good progress in connecting different countries in, in terms of electricity. So whenever you know, projects of benefit, we have no issue. The difficulty when we speak about political issues, where do we stand from different issues, that's where we have differences. We have a question here, please. Thank you. Um, my name is Karim Ambar. I have a question for Mr. Abdurrahman Niyadi. As I work in the field of women empowerment, I would like to know uh, if there is a national 
or international policy of the UAE. Uh, regarding what you uh, mentioned, women empowerment to counter terrorism. I mean, we have always saw it as a part of our women empowerment uh, objective. We, we have always saw it as building healthy society, is building more resilient society to the ideas of extremism. And that has been always within the, the vision that we have. I'm not sure if there is a, a global push to look at it from that perspective, but that's, to be clear, women empowerment is, is that, that is one element of women empowerment. Women empowerment is much larger as well. It has also that economic, uh, uh, economic um, goals uh, of uh, enhancing uh, the um, uh, economic work workforce, the entrepreneurship, and, and all that within the same spectrum. But I wanted to shed light on uh, addressing the idea of extremism through an angle of uh, creating a healthy society, which women is a fundamental part of it. Thank you. Very short one. People think of agriculture and farmers as men. Very far from that. Most of the agriculture is done by women. We work with 6,000 farmers and we are shocked. We're starting, we reach 20,000 farmers in Egypt. When I go to the community, I move my office to Saeed. I'm dealing more with the women farmers. Oops, uh, I think it's a sign from above. I should come. The second point is I talked about food consumption and wellness. This is purely will come to the issues of teenagers and pre-teenager food intake. And this is again, back to the woman uh, important role. So in terms of food security, woman inclusion as a critical component, not as a nice thing to have, but as a critical component of either producing food through agriculture or consuming proper food and nutrition, women are like in the center of this puzzle. And we are now working more and more with women and that's getting us to a lot of issues related to it in the Middle Eastern society of who controls the economic wealth among the farmer community. But uh, that's something I believe we need to look at. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to President Al Hamidi. Uh, I'm Riyad Tabet. I am a city planner and urban uh, sociologist. In the area, the Middle East area, you have uh, countries with a high income level per capita, and we have countries with very low level of income per capita, even though these countries might have a, an important resources. So from your point of view as a president of the Arab Monetary Fund, do you think that the development problem of the area is a prob economic, demographic, or politic? Or all the above. We have, we have issues with political issues, security issues, economic issues, but I, I, I really think that when, Mandu, do you want to take that so you relieve me from answering that? We, let us, I think we should focus on, on the issues. I think youth is very important. Listen, we have the right paradigm in the region. Other regions, they are getting into, um, um, you know, the, the old age. Our region is, it has youth, 60%. In some countries, 65 percent below 40 years. Therefore, we need to ch to change the look or the way of our economic development model uh, 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 on how to work out with this new generation. Um, what I, as a Saudi, what I the changes I have seen, because now those in the leadership positions mostly young. They can interact with the youth, not my generation. They know what they want, and they do it perfectly. So I don't need to go to Saudi anymore. 
I use my mobile for all my needs. Yes. And that was not introduced by my generation. It's introduced by the current generation. And I agree, uh, you know, giving women opportunity. I was at the university. My first career was in the academia. And I taught uh, w uh, um, uh, also ladies. And I, they, you know, at that time, they A's for them and C's for the boys. So they are very, in Saudi, they are very educated. Once they are given the opportunity, now 30% of the labor, 35% of the labor market in Saudi are women. Who would believe this? In, in six year time, we went up to that level and therefore changing the model. Before, you, before it becomes imposed on you because you need it. This is, I think, what, what UAE also was a leader in this. And I think that we have, um, we have um, uh, other countries like Jordan, Morocco, because we work with all those countries, also Jordan and Morocco in terms of the clean energy. I think they have done a, a very good job. Um, and, and therefore, yes, there are models that are working, unfortunately, you know, challenges comes from everywhere. Um, Sudan is a, an issue. Uh, Palestine now is another issue. And therefore, um, again, I, I believe somebody from this region, we need to focus on economic issues. Our leaders should focus on economic issues. I think that could help in enlarging our market. You know, the, the, uh, the Arab common market was agreed upon before the Europeans. If you go back to the city, that was in the 50s. 56. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, uh, and we, uh, where are we now? We implemented nothing. Exactly. Because we went off the economic issues. I think we should go back. We have a very large market with the youth population. The private sector could be very vibrant with what we have. You know, with, with all those issues, clean energy, educated, young male and female, I think we can, but we need to change the paradigm. Let us give the young generation the opportunity. They are given in the UAE and Saudi and they are making a change. This lady, please. Yes, uh, Sumeya Abdelatif, uh, uh, Vice President of uh, Robert Schumann Institute. My question is for Dr. Amuna. Can you tell us more about the solution of one state that uh, Mr. Dahlan announced, uh, proposed, or it's just an announcement uh, effect? No, I think he's very well read about the, 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 the solution. He is born in Khan Yunis. He is from Gaza. He was, uh, he was in charge of Gaza before, before he he, he fell off with uh, Abbas. I think he is the best person to do this. Now, the idea of a one-state solution was first proposed long ago by somebody called Rashid Khalidi, in case you know him. He's a big professor of political science in the United States, very well appreciated. And it was his idea that two-state solution is not feasible. After what is happening now, I don't think it is feasible. Mr. Netanyahu has killed the two-state solution. Khalas, you can't, you can't go back to it now. So you have to think of something new. And I think that Mr. Dahlan, who is very much involved in this, he has the, the, the protection of the uh, UAE uh, uh, ruler. He's the advisor of the UAE ruler. He has good relations with the Israelis, with the Palestinians, with General Sisi. You can't get better. I think that he is has he's putting oh, he's putting uh, uh, he's putting his all his credentials in in place for people to pick up what he's saying. I personally will write an article about him. I'm very much for Mr. Dahlan. He must not. He might not be the best, but he knows his, his uh, the issue exactly, and he has a very good supporters within Gaza. 
Mm. So just a question for Mona. On if the alternative was not Dahlan but Marwan Barghouthi. If what? If the alternative was not Dahlan but, but Marwan Barghouthi. Barghouthi, whether it is Mustafa Barghouthi or the other Barghouthi, and the one who is in jail is Mamdouh Barghouthi, no, Mahmoud. Mahmoud Barghouthi or Mustafa Barghouthi, each one of them is Marwan Barghouti, each one of them is probably better as a human being than Muhammad Dahlan. But Muhammad Dahlan is a politician, and he is accepted by many people on different sides. This is what we want if we want somebody to, to lead Gaza as it is now, because he even has uh, he has connections with the people of Hamas, having been born in the same uh, uh, the same community, which is Khan Yunus. So the others, I I respect them very highly, both Marwan and Mustafa Barghouti, whom I have known personally. But I don't think that they will be accepted either by Israel or by the rest. Thank you. Um, I'm Ahmed Awad, I'm in the area of human rights, and I work for the UAE government, so um, I'm UAE-based. Um, yeah, there's so many things, very interesting, and uh, my question is to Madame uh, Mona. It's I can't hear you. Yeah, to keep to me. Hello, hello, ça va? Not like mine, but at least they do. Yeah, okay. Uh, my name is Ahmed, Ahmed Awad. I'm in the area of human rights, and I work for the UAE government. Uh, my note is for Madame Mona. Uh, whether, uh, I wonder if you have thought about any reconciliation process. This is extremely important, especially in the light of what we hear on the, some news that there is the Palestinian in Gaza and Palestinian in the West Bank. Yeah. They're extremely important. So from my experience, I worked in Geneva in the Human Rights Council and the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Every time you have a conflict, if you don't have a reconciliation process afterwards, it will be very difficult to keep uh, a pace uh, moving. So it is important First of all, for the inter-Palestinian, inside the Palestinians themselves. Secondly, no donors, whether institutions like the World Bank or whatever, or any state donors will not give a single uh, euro or dirham if there is no consensus inside the, the, the country. So I think that the reconciliation process is extremely important to uh, address before and going any further. Thank you. I think your, your remark is very well taken because there will be no consensus if they don't have uh, some arrangement among them. But this is why I have spoken about Ahmad Dahlan because he has the connections. He has the connections for different sides that are mostly warring at each other. But as he is born, in this place, in Gaza, I think he has more privilege than any other. Inshallah. Questions, comments, speakers? Any comments? Abdurrahman, please. I just, I just want to comment on the presentation of... Uh, uh, <laughs> and I'll, I'll be quick on, on uh, Ernesto's uh, presentation. It's, it's very important because in, in policy, in foreign policy right now, we see a lot of, of uh, connection between uh, po policy and foreign policy and technical issues. We deal with it every day. It's very important. When you spoke about debuckling and de-risking, it's, we see it from a policy point of view in which you create, you try to create an, uh, an, an, uh, a strategic autonomy somehow to address the issues or to build the re resiliency toward issues such as uh, COVID-19 and other issues. It's, it's very important and I think we should embrace technology going forward and could be a solution to many of, uh, of what we see.
in our world. Thank you. I may make a comment on this. The I also tried to deliver a warning that comes from the mathematical modeling. Deploying the technology uh, with, uh, you say, in a, in a, in a no-trust environment may not deliver the quality of optimization that you expect the technology to deliver. So the less the trust uh, uh, you want, uh, the, and the more uh, uh, you want to control risk, the less you can expect benefit you can expect from the technological based platforms collaboration. So this is, was just by, so we need to, to balance between how much risk we want to take and how much we expect for the joint optimization to deliver. That's, that was just my point. Go ahead, please. My name is uh, Younes Zrikam. I'm uh, Moroccan and, uh, and French. I work at the Boston Consulting Group. I just wanted to, I mean, f many of you know, know that, but maybe for, for the others, uh, about the Palestinians, and as we are saying that the going back to the sta status quo ante is not an option, we, we have to remember, and maybe Mohammed Dahlan is, is an option, but we have to remember that there are different categories or different Palestinians. There are Palestinians in Gaza, there are Palestinians in the, in the West Bank, there are Palestinians all around the region. You know, 60% of the Jordanians are Palestinians. We heard 300,000 Palestinians in, in Lebanon, uh, in Syria, so on and, and so forth. There are the Palestinians in Israel, almost 1.5 million uh, Palestinian Israelis who have a, an Israeli passport. There are the Palestinians outside in Europe, in Northern America and, and elsewhere. So we have five, five categories of, of Palestinians and I think each category should be heard and taken into account in any political future, future solution. And um, I think it's what you said is important about the fact that Mohammed Dahlan was born in Khan Yunus and, and comes from Gaza, but I think probably a solution should take that into account. Because even in the, the Oslo negotiations, we know that they were mostly led by say, the diaspora of uh, Palestinian uh, abroad. And, and maybe that is one of the reasons why um, things didn't go uh, as, as, as well as they should have been. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do we have questions? Comment. <laughs> Time to go. <laughs> then please give me the opportunity to thank all those speakers, the seven speakers, for their very comprehensive introductory remarks. And thank you so much for making this session very active. Absolutely. And hopefully to see you in the near future in other events. Thank you.